Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so, yeah, so today is parts uh, three and four of uh, my little lecture series about C++ for doing HPC or numerical computing, however you want to put it. Um, so, as ever, I'm uh, very happy to take any questions uh, as we go along. It's probably easiest if you type them in the chat window, which you should be able to see on Collaborate. Uh, you can also, there's a little button to raise your hand, which will make the uh, Collaborate beep at me. So I definitely notice you. Um, and yeah, well, um, thanks very much for joining me sitting on your computer on a beautiful sunny afternoon when you probably wish you were sitting in the park or something. Um, yeah, so before I get going, are there any sort of uh, questions uh, from the first half of this? Um, Um, so don't be shy to jump in with uh, any uh, from the last time as well uh, in the first couple of slides uh, as we get going. So um, see, yeah. so a recap. So um, one thing that a couple of uh, people mentioned in passing was the iterators, just to go over it again a bit. So um, if we have some vector of data that we've got from some source, um, you know, you've got your standard C style iteration over that, which is um, a fully explicit way of doing it. So you have to be aware that you have an index space that runs from zero up to, but not including n. You explicitly deal with that, and uh, you know, obviously, after a bit of experience of programming, this is just totally transparent to you what it's trying to do. Um, but you do have to be fully explicit about what's going on. Uh, in the middle is the sort of traditional uh, C++ style of doing things, which hides some of the details. You don't have to deal with the explicit iteration. You can treat the iterator as a pointer to the current bit of data. Um, but it's still quite ver verbose, uh, even though the, the new auto um, type deduction does make it less onerous to type. Uh, and then at the bottom, you've got the newer um, range-based for loop that C11 has introduced. And that um, that hides a lot of the details from you while still giving um, performance exactly as good as the C style iteration at the top. And um, a few more details about how templates work and uh, the ways you might want to use them. So um, from the, the first part of two weeks ago, um, we had a very simple example with the, uh, the sum template function that just adds two numbers of types that will be uh, deduced at compile time. Um, so we use this uh, without specifying explicitly what type t was. So if we say x and y are both integers, and then we call the sum template function passing those in, the compiler is doing uh, what's called template argument deduction for us. And what this means is it examines the types of the expressions that you give as arguments to the function, and then it tries to choose, choose t such that the type of the uh, the expressions given to it and the expected type from the function signature match, or at least are implicitly convertible to each other. Um, and it's important to note that the template parameter t in this little example and the type of the function's arguments might be different, but you know, of course, they could they they need to be related in some sense. So we've got F, G, and H here, three little uh, trivial um, declarations here. So F, the 
type is just T. Uh, it is the, the instantiation type of the template. In G, we're taking a reference to that type. And in H, we are taking a constant reference to the type X. So they are not necessarily the same, but they are related to each other. And this will impact on how the compiler does the uh, argument uh, deduction, uh, template argument deduction. So that means the deduction of the arguments of the types of the template. Uh, and this means that, for example, if you were to pass a const int to h, it would deduce t to be uh, an integer because that's implicitly convertible. As in, you can pass an int to a, a constant reference expression, and that will be fine. So the, the full rules for doing this are pretty complex. Um, there's a good uh, summary of this in uh, Meyer's book about uh, C++. It's in the first chapter. It's actually free online, that one, so you can go and read this. Um, and all the little intricacies are quite complex, but there is a reason for all of the complexities. But I find that usually you don't need to know, think about the rules um, explicitly and just think about two things. First is whether you want to copy the argument or not. Uh, and whether you want to be able to hand, whether you can handle a const argument. And if you want to copy the argument that is passed into your function, uh, then you don't add the reference ampersand symbol to the uh, signature. And if you do want to copy, then you leave it out. And for the constness, um, you want to try and be able to handle const arguments, because generally uh, that gives the compiler more, more chances to optimize. It gives makes life easier for you in terms of reasoning about your code. But uh, you will often be need to be able to um, deal with non-const things. So in those cases, leave out the const. So the auto keyword is, again, something that um, people are maybe a little bit confused about. The auto keyword basically says to the compiler, you can deduce the type of this expression. And the auto keyword follows almost exactly the same rules as template argument deduction, but unfortunately is a bit tr bit easier to get wrong. Um, um, so it's even more important to express what you want to do uh, rather than just what's convenient to do. So um, basically, you can have three cases. So you you can use auto x, and that will make a copy of the thing that you are assigning from, the expression you're assigning from. You can use a ref auto reference uh, to x when you want a reference to the individual, the original thing, and you might modify it. And uh, finally, you can use auto const reference uh, to the variable when you want a reference to the original thing and you're not going to modify it. And generally, you want to try and use as low down that list as possible. Um, so this is the, the sort of the, one of the big topics for what I want to talk about today, which is the standard algorithms library. Um, and this includes around about 100 function templates that implement an algorithm. Um, so these are things like count the elements that match some criteria, divide these elements based on some condition. Uh, and in the current uh, versions of the standard, these all use iterators to specify the range of data that they're going to work on. So for example, uh, if you want to use count, you might use um, a standard vectors begin and end iterators. So this little example uh, here. So we want to count uh, the number of zeros in some vector of integers. We, we call standard count using the full range of our um, data vector. And the, uh, the thing we want to match against is there as the final third argument. And that is just 
the same type as the uh, element, the, the value type of the um, standard vector. And that will just return the number of those for you. Um, the second example I'm doing is using an unary functor to uh, figure, figure this out. So uh, we define some little um, unary predicate is prime that return, examines its argument and returns a true or false flag, whether that's true or not. And then we call countif, and that will um, look at every item in the range and uh, accumulate the total number of where, uh, elements where the predicate is true. So here's a um, possible implementation of this template function. So it's a template uh, with two template parameters and its input iterator class and uh, the unary predicate class, which um, could just be a function pointer. Uh, so for countif, we, uh, the return type is um, some integer type. Um, we give the first and the last elements in the range, and then we pass in our um, predicate function-like thing. We set the number of ones we found to zero. We loop through an, uh, all the ones until the first is equal to the last. Increment the first one. Then we call the predicate function on the value pointed to by the current uh, iterator state. And if we uh, get a true for that, we increment our count of uh, elements. And then once we've looped through everything that's there, we return our current count. So I hope that shows that these are not super mysterious things that have to be very complicated. You can write very relatively simple implementations. So uh, this little table is basically all of the standard library algorithms that I have used more than once. Um, so um, for each, which is just apply some function to every element in the range, count and count if, so it returns the number of matches, find and find if return uh, pointer or it iterators to the first element that matches or the end if there isn't one, copy and copy if, so it copies um, the input range to some destination uh, if the predicate's true in the latter case. Transform um, is basically apply the function uh, to some elements and element range and store the answer in a destination. Swap, well, self-explanatory, swap two values. Sort, again, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Sort the range uh, in ascending order using uh, the binary predicate that you provide. Or uh, if you don't provide one, it will use operator less than. Then uh, lower bound and upper range. So if you pass in a sorted range, so if you've built yourself a heap already, um, it will do a binary search within that to find a value matching some condition. Okay, so for each, so this is probably the simplest algorithm in some sense, so we just apply something to every element in our range. Um, so the template is relative, the function signature is pretty um, Pretty simple, we pass in the first and last iterators and we apply some function to it. Um, so why would you want to do this? And that is a reasonable question. So some arguments that you might, for why you might want to do this is um, you're, you're, you're clearly stating your intent to the other readers of uh, your program. Um, you can't get things like off by one errors or skip elements accidentally. It will interoperate well with other range-based algorithms. And by a range, I mean a sort of a first and last uh, iterator pair. And if you already have your operation written in a function, it's very concise. But I would, uh, personally, I, I think that a range-based for loop is usually the right option instead of a for each. Um, um, so yeah, there are no four ways to iterate through some range of uh, 
say, a, sta a standard vector here that I've talked about uh, today and two weeks ago. So the, the three we've talked about already, and then the last one, you've got uh, the new standard for each. So transform is um, another one. This is a very powerful function, and it's basically the equivalent of the sort of map concept if you're a functional programmer. So what you do is you pass in the range of your inputs and pass an output iterator that points to the destination's starting point. And then you have some unary operation, uh, transformation operation that you want to apply to every element in the input range and store in the output. So uh, a little example, if we transform some data um, from beginning to end, and then we are actually going to store this back into its uh, um, input destination. So we're calling this double in place functor that I meant uh, was on the previous slide also. So for the rest of that table, I suggest just having a little look at the documentation that's online. The cppreference.com is very thorough. Um, but you know, why might you want to do this? So uh, the implementations uh, have been written by someone else. And if they're in your compiler's standard library, you can be pretty confident that they've been well tested by um, the suppliers of your system. So there's some work you don't have to do, which is always great as a, um, a software engineer. And the library might be uh, doing some platform specific optimizations that while you could implement, you probably don't want to maintain them across multiple platforms. Hello, Jose, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, don't worry. We're going to talk about lambdas. That's coming up, don't worry. Uh, yeah, so the uh, one one reason is um, that I find them useful is that they form a, a language to communicate with other people. And this isn't just other people. It also includes yourself in the future. Um, and they express the intent of what you want to do, um, which is obviously an important thing. So what's going on in that first code fragment has to be read in detail. Uh, whereas the second example, um, you know, is a bit easier to understand at a glance what's going on. It's copying uh, from the images thing into uh, the cat pics thing if it contains cat. And you can read this um, much, much more quickly than the first one. There you go, Jose. So um, all of these algorithms that we I've just talked about, they, um, they, they need you to provide a function or a function like object as an argument, uh, which is going to actually implement the behavior that they need. So having to declare a new function for one off use in an algorithm call um, is quite inconvenient. It moves the code away from its use site, which is uh, confusing and adds some maintenance burdens. Uh, and worse, you might even need to create a custom functor object every time that's going to have its own members. And you've got to think about um, how you're going to construct this and uh, so on. So for example, if we wanted to square some input number and add a constant to it, so we want to do um, z squared plus c, for example, uh, if we wanted to implement that uh, in a sort of um, well parameterized uh, way, we might end up writing some functor type class here, square and add const functor that's going to have a member variable, the constant. It's going to need a constructor, which it, wherein you tell it that constant. And it's going to need an operator parentheses, which is the function call operator overload in C++. And this needs to accept for an argument and give back another one. And then we actually encode something, some meaningful information there in that line. And then where we use it, um, 
we need to say uh, if we're going to go store our answer in some vector and accept some input vector as well as the constant, we um, we need to construct it and pass it into transform and then return the answer after that's run. So uh, we C++ 11 has introduced uh, uh, a concept to C++ of a lambda function, also known as a closure or an anonymous function. And this is a function-like thing that does not have a name, uh, like the functions we've always used uh, in C and C++ so far. You can define one uh, wherever you like, inside a function or not. And you can bind them to a variable and call them and pass them around just like uh, any other value. Um, um, the newer thing for C++ uh, is that they can capture local variables, uh, either by value or by reference. And uh, we'll talk about what capture means in a moment. Um, one sort of proviso is that they have a, a unique unknown type uh, that you can't get at unless you uh, are a compiler uh, writer. Um, so you have to use auto if you want to store them in a variable, or you can also pass them straight uh, to a template argument and let the compiler deduce the type to whatever it is uh, when it instantiates the template for you. So we can make our example um, less verbose. So we don't need to define a functor class outside of our little function. We just uh, define our lambda here. So this is what the syntax looks like. We put in square brackets the list of the captures. So here we're just capturing C, our constant. We're giving the uh, the function argument list there, and then the function body, just as a normal function body, uh, it's just z squared plus the constant. And then, of course, because it's a statement, we do have to terminate it with semicolon. People sometimes get a bit confused by that, but this this bit do, this bit creates the um, the uh, lambda, and then we assign it, uh, and that's our statement done. And then we can pass this uh, function straight into our standard transform here. And of course, we can make it a little bit uh, less verbose again by just uh, defining the lambda in place and passing it with it without binding it to a name. Oh, have I missed a close parentheses? I have. Sorry, just jotting that down so I can fix that. Right, so um, this is the sort of specification of what a lambda looks like. Um, so the square brackets the, here is the new syntax that um, sort of introduces the lambda and indicates that this what follows is indeed a lambda expression. So then we've got a, a function argument list, which is exactly as you're used to creating for um, your own function declarations. Then uh, the function body is, again, exactly as you're used to. That's just uh, the normal function body, so zero or more statements like you might have in any function. Um, there's no restrictions on what you can put inside it in terms of the usual uh, constructs. Anything you can stick inside a normal function, you can put there. So this um, arrow return type here uh, is the new C++ style syntax for specifying the return type of a function. You can, in fact, do this for any uh, function that you declare, as long as you put auto first as the return type. This basically just is a placeholder indicating it's indeed a function, and then the um, return type will be specified later. But you have to put it afterwards for a lambda. Uh, this tells the compiler what type is going to be returned, um, but you can skip it. If the return type is void, or the function body is only a single return statement, at least in the C++11, when you move to C++17, you can 
uh, let the compiler deduce it for you based on the return statement inside your function body. Um, and then finally, we'll go back to the first thing, the captures. So this is a, a list of the uh, captures that are made by the Lambda. So you can capture a value by copy. So you can just put its name there. So if you have a local variable called local, you just write its name there, and its value will be stored by copy inside the Lambda that is produced by this statement. Or you can capture it by reference. So if you just put an ampersand before its name, it will be captured uh, as a um, as if it was a reference member of a, a struct or something uh, inside the function body. So this does create a, a function object of a unique uh, unnamed type. Oh, Jose is asking a question. So what's the difference between passing an argument in the arg list and capturing it in the, uh, the square bracket? Um, so what's the difference in between putting a value in the arg list and in the capture list? So this creates an object uh, executing the Lambda statement. And this object has two ways of getting data when it runs its function body. It can either get the data from what was captured when it was created or the values that are passed in when it is run. So for example, if you capture things uh, when you create it and then return this from a function, you are keeping uh, the variable, the values that were present when it was created, not when you call it later, which um, you know could be at any future point in your program if you uh, hold on to it. Um, does that make sense? It's the difference between, for example, the arguments you pass to a class's constructor which are stored inside it somehow, and the values that you pass to it when you call its member functions. Does that make sense? OK. OK, so yeah, like I said before, this creates a, a unique type that uh, you can't get at the name of. So if you want to store the lambda that is created, you have to use auto to um, declare the variable. And then you can call it um, uh, the lambda like you would any object that has an overload of operator parentheses, the function call um, over uh, operator. So, So, for example, if we go back to the, um, the squaring and add a constant one here, and uh, if we were to create it with our constant, whatever C is, uh, and then call it with the argument three, we would print the value of nine, three squared, plus whatever the constant was. Okay, and it's also important to note that because uh, it, it doesn't have a name of its own. Uh, it can't take place, uh, can't take part in any overload resolution. So you can't, for example, assign, go auto uh, some function name that's got a load of overloads already equals a lambda and have the lambda take part because the function itself does not have a name. You have just bound it to a variable with the same name, if that makes sense. Okay, so a very, very brief quiz. What does this uh, following uh, set of line noise do? Could anyone take a guess? Dennis says a no-op. Yes, that's correct. So what this is doing is this is introducing a lambda that captures nothing. It takes no arguments. It has no state 
no uh, statements, and then we're calling it. So it is indeed a complete nothing. Um, okay, so again, why why do you want to? So um, using it with the standard algorithms library or any other library that you might want to write that uh, uh, needs to be given some functions to do its work. Uh, so they're great for passing in uh, sort of little one-off pieces of code. So for example, if you need to sort some uh, list of molecules and you want to sort them by their charge uh, member, you can quite easily create one in line uh, that just takes two molecules and compares the charges with operator less, and you're done. The library will take care of doing the sort for you. Another very useful uh, place where you might want to use them is if you want to do some very complex initialization on something that you would normally want to be const. So for example, if you need a set of random numbers of some size, uh, and you're never going to modify this during the rest of your function, you could, you may want to mark it const, but in the usual way of doing things, you can't. However, here we can uh, create our lambda that captures the size. Uh, it doesn't take any other arguments when we call it, and it returns a standard vector of floats. Then inside we initialize the answer to the right size. We uh, call some random number generator to generate each element. And then we return the standard vector back to uh, the call site, and then we call it immediately. So note that there are the parentheses there to actually call it. And this will do the, um, so this thing will only be mutable while, we're mod while we want to be modifying it. And from then on after, it is uh, constant and immutable, which is useful um, in terms of reasoning about what's going on. So a few rules of thumb. Um, the most important thing is to be careful what you capture, okay? If you capture, if your lambda is being used locally, so that means that your lambda is going to exist only in the local scope of your function and any functions that might be called by it. So that includes passing it into algorithms and other things. You're probably going to want to capture things by reference. And this uh, ensures that there's no copies made of any data. And if you want to be changing things, which you have to specify explicitly uh, with the mutable keywords that you can read about in the, the docs online, uh, this means that you're not doing any copies. You can change things as you need. But if you are using the Lambda elsewhere in your code, um, really, especially if you return it from your current function or you're assigning it uh, into some other object that's going to outlive your local scope, you probably want to be capturing by value. Um, so remember, references to locals any local variables you've got are invalid after the function uh, has returned. So your lambda might be holding on to a reference to something that has been destroyed. Uh, and that could cause undefined behavior, most likely either garbage results or uh, a segmentation fault. So um, even if they are still valid, it's much harder to keep track of what's going on in your program. So that's generally something you don't want to do. And um, the last one is possibly a bit more controversial and more just what I think, um, is keep try and keep your lambdas short. Anything more than, say, 10 lines, you should probably be moving it into its own function with a name and a short documentation string, uh, if it's more complex, into a little function-like object. Um, sorry, excuse me. Okay, so traits, um, so I'll sort of explain what these mean as we go through. So type traits are a very important generic programming technique that's used uh, across the whole of the standard library in C++. It's basically a sort of if, then, else, or perhaps more um, 
accurately as a sort of a, a switch case type statement for but instead of acting on uh, variables it's acting on types themselves so what you generally do is you provide a template class that has either type defs or member functions that specify the configurable parts of your algorithm and then your generic algorithm uses this class specialized on the type that it's currently working on to select the behavior that's going to happen um, and the advantage of this is you don't have to change the source code of either your algorithm or the type that you're working on to be able to configure things to adapt to each other so the standard template standard template library has um, a couple of header files that contain traits um, the type traits one uh, has lots of um, uh, of these uh, trait classes for handling uh, for querying the um, the properties of types um, for example the standard is pointer class template um, accepts one type which is the the type that you want to query and inside it has a type def uh, value that will either be true or false depending on whether the type you pass in is a pointer so for example int would give you false but if you passed in int star that would give you true and there's a large number of these for querying many different aspects of what a type is Um, another one is the numeric limits uh, uh, template class. Uh, so if you pass in a, a, um, one of the built-in um, number types like uh, float, double, int, car, and so on, this will give you a lot of parameters um, for these, such as the smallest and largest values, whether they're integers, floating, um, float min, float max, the exponents available and so on. Um, you also get the infinities for the floating types. And uh, there are an awful lot of traits that are used uh, behind the scenes everywhere in the standard uh, library uh, for efficiency. So there are things like the traits of iterators that describe whether they can go backwards and forwards or random access and so on. So uh, just to motivate a little bit, I'll give you um, a real example from a project that I've worked on in the past. So if you want a, a sort of C++ style wrapper around a message passing library, um, does anyone not know what MPI is here? Okay, I'm going to assume you know what MPI is at least roughly. So when you make an MPI call, you always have to specify the types of the uh, data that you want it to transfer, whether it's a, an MPI float or an MPI int or whatever that is. But you might take the opinion that since the compiler knows these types already, uh, you should not have to be specifying this. So you may want to have an interface that looks like this. So you have some communicator class that you, uh, whatever, and this has a template function that's going to accept a vector of a standard vector of some data that it's not going to modify and you just want to say send it to this destination rank and give it this tag uh, and you want to be able to use it uh, something like this you get your communicator from somewhere say it's MPI com world from whatever the interface looks like you create some data and you just want to go send the data to whatever other rank it is okay and have the um, the library know the type and the size of your vector since it's got all this already why should you have to re-specify it so you might have your very simple implementation look like this so you've got your communicator send member function it takes the, the data the destination and the tag and you call mpi send you cast the data to a void pointer you pass in the size, that's nice and easy. Um, you've got to put something for the data type. So the question is, how do you fill in that data type here? 
So for all the types in the MPI standard, you could provide a specialization for each of them. So you could do a template specialization or for integer here, say, where you just explicitly put in MPI int and so on for double and car and float and all the rest of it. Um, so the problem is that there are quite a lot of types in the MPI standard. Uh, I think it's about 20 offhand. And there are a lot of MPI calls, uh, about 200, uh, that need to, you may want to wrap all of them if you are writing a full featured library. And so you've got to write uh, uh, m times n 4,000 odd specializations, uh, which is horrendous. And then you've got to think about how you're going to add any custom types uh, that your user is using because MPI does support custom data types. So the user would have to be able to mess around with uh, our little MPI library here, which is uh, not a good thing. So the, the traits based solution is to create a class that tells our functions how to handle uh, these different types. So for example, we would create a struct uh, data type traits, or maybe MPI data type traits would have been a better name. And we don't we, we provide one member function, which is the function to get an MPI data type that's suitable for this specialization. And we don't provide a default implementation of this. So this means in the generic case, we don't know how to do this. And so if we were to not provide any more, this would never work. But we'll come back to that. So inside the, the implementation of the send function, we specialize the traits class on our current working class, and we call the get uh, static member function, and that will return the MPI data type we need uh, to make this work. And what we've got to do is provide these specialized uh, definitions for all the types that we know how to handle. So we could specialize this for an integer and a float and so on for all the other types we know about in the standard and any in our application we could specialize it for whatever special types. For example, if we go back to molecular dynamics and we've got a molecule type, we could specialize it for that. And that could, uh, we just have to make sure that our application has uh, committed the data type to MPI at some point before. And then if we try to call this uh, send member function on the data type that we haven't specialized for, we'll get a compile time error saying uh, that there is no existing specialization for this. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be, uh, it will be flagged at compile time that we haven't done this, which is quite efficient. Um, why isn't this going to the next one? Oh, and yeah, so uh, there's plenty of documentation and examples of how to do this online. Uh, just a quick Google for C++ type traits will throw up lots of examples of uh, people using this. Uh, so this is, that's it for part one. I'm very happy to take your questions about anything I've talked about now or last time, or if you've had a look at the um, exercises which are on GitHub, uh, I'm happy to talk about that for the next 20 minutes or so. But thanks very much for your attention. Questions? Hello. Harvey asks if I can differentiate a functor from a function. So uh, a function in C++ is, well, what you think it is. It is a, a piece of code for which you've uh, written a function declaration and then provided uh, a definition. Uh, whereas a functor is an object which has an overload for operator parentheses. Uh, which I'll just, so you've got your, um, it's any struct for which you've defined an overload for operator whatever, and then whatever args it takes, and a body, if that makes sense. OK, if no one has any further questions, I'm going to sign off. Um, there's a seminar happening here in EPCC, so I'm going to restart at five past four instead of four sharp. Um, uh, yeah, so I hope to see some of you then. We're going to be talking about 
uh, sort of frameworks for portable performance across multiple architectures. Um, then, uh, right. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon.